2017 signals the start of a new geopolitical order, a new world map which has been shaped as we speak here in Davos and elsewhere across the world. But let me get special perspective from an imminent panel who joins me in this uh, icy Davos morning. Martin Wolf, Associate Editor and Chief Economics Commentator of the Financial Times. Next to him is Fateh Birol, the Executive Director, International Energy Agency. Geeta Gopinath, the Professor of Economics at Harvard University. And Minzu, President, National Institution of Financial Research, People's Republic of China, covering all parameters that possibly exist in this new global order. Let me begin with you, Martin. Do you think IC Davos has put some heat on Trump and trying to prevent uh, the rise and the takeover, uh, which many believe would signal the end of globalization? Well, I suspect that Davos contains more or less every sort of person he despises. And he's not going to be very impressed by most of them, particularly all the foreigners who are bleating about him. He will be concerned about American business and uh, the American business reaction. But my impression so far is that American business is quite upbeat. They, the, you can see it in the, the markets. Uh, there's a, a lot of talk of animal spirits here among American business people. I've been here before when there's a big divide between the Americans and everyone else. It happened at the time of the Iraq war. It was very, very hot, and I think that's here now. But basically, I think Trump will say, these are the bleaters, the people who are not on my side. Uh, they're the enemy. My supporters back me. Who cares about these Davos people? Mr. Beryl, do you believe that, that there is a geopolitical order which is completely different from the world that we've seen before? I don't think so. Of course, there are uh, many changes uh, in, the, in the United States, in the UK, and maybe elsewhere. But the energy sector fundamentals do not change from one day to another. Uh, the economic uh, facts are very stubborn, uh, especially when it comes to the energy sector. So I don't see major changes uh, happening in the energy sector as a result of this recent political uh, movements. Right. Gita, I have to ask you, you know, it's often said that extreme economics breeds extreme politics. Some would argue it's the other way around. But how do you justify this argument that the inequality gaps or the have-have-nots or ignored middle class is just reshaping global leadership and therefore economics as we see it? Yes, I think what we should do is remember that this is coming out of a period of eight years of very low growth in the developed world. So it's not just the rise in inequality, but it is the fact that growth has been low everywhere. And you could, if you compare the U.S., where inequality has gone up, there's the backlash against globalization. But if you take France, where inequality hasn't gone up, but it's had low growth, it, the backlash against globalization has gone up. So I think people like to force it through the lens of inequality, but for me, the bigger issue is low growth at this point. Low growth. And that brings me, uh, to on to the topic of the most powerful speaker, perhaps, in Davos, uh, who set the tone. You had considerable experience as, obviously, the Deputy Managing Director at IMF as well, and now uh, working closely with China. Is Xi Jinping the star of Davos, and has he now become globalization's unusual defender? I think the, the speech is much more, much welcomed by the audience, very much uh, uh, appreciated, have a deep impact. Uh, I heard a lot of comments from all different corners of this Davos, and the message is very clear. Uh, China support continue and the globalization. China will continue to reform, to open, to bridge the whole wall, and to, to support the growth, as uh, our panelists mentioned, the low growth of current uh, situations. I think those are very important message, and China will continue to do its own part, but will try to work with all the other parts of the world to support the global uh, uh, globalization move forward. Okay, let me get to the China message, because is this credible, um, Martin? Let me ask you how the rest of the world is looking at Xi Jinping, who has been associated as being the leader of a protectionist authoritarian regime, many would say, being this new face who is ready to step into, say, Donald Trump's shoes? Well, a couple of comments. First of all, it's an absolutely stunning event. Uh, I was, was thinking 30 years ago, if someone had told me I will be here, uh, or even 20 years ago, and the, the president of China would deliver the sort of speech that I would normally expect the president of the United States to give, uh, pro-globalization, 
pro-world uh, economic opening, uh, chiding the U.S. for protectionism implicitly. I would say that's impossible that you would have this contrast uh, in the way we have. So he's done something very bold and very important. Uh, I think we want to believe him. I have no doubt it is in China's interest to maintain an open world order. China's development has been based on it. Uh, I, there are two questions. How committed are they? I believe that in the economic sphere they are genuinely committed to openness. I think that's a real thing. Uh, and the second question is can China do this on its own? If the US really goes protectionist, will it be possible for China to sustain an open order? And my answer to that, it will be very, very difficult, particularly because I think if the US goes protectionist, Europe might be tempted to follow. It is a real risk. So whether China can do this on, this, on its own, I don't know. I doubt it. But the message is a mature one, a sensible one, and very encouraging. Gita, can the rest of the world survive in this polarized context, so to speak? So the U.S. and the Europe pursue this active uh, nationalism, patriotic, uh, protectionist economics, and the rest of the world tries to pursue globalization the best that they can do. What do you think will be the eventual winners and losers in this context? Oh, there's there uh, no winners in this context. I think because. If the, if the U.S. and Europe decide to become more protectionist, then there's going to be a tit for tat. There's going to be a trade war, and usually with a trade war, you end up with everybody losing. And so my hope is that, that uh, the Trump administration doesn't move towards that. Uh, it's not very clear that that will happen because he's sent mixed signals. I mean, if you look at his appointments in terms of the Treasury Secretary and the Commerce Secretary, they are people who do not strike anybody as being anti-trade. But then he had certain other people, like Peter Navarro, who struck people as being very, uh, very strongly anti-trade. So, uh, you know, it, it is not a good day, and it's not a good day for emerging markets, for sure, if uh, the U.S. and Europe decide to become uh, protectionist. Minzu, how would you uh, interpret this message coming in from Trump's team and what Gita is speaking about, this duality, so to speak? Uh, because even his advisor who was here at Davos, Anthony Scamucci, says, our, uh, our president is actually refreshing. This is his new style of globalism. Would you buy that? Does China buy that? Well, this is very confusing, I have to say. I mean, we, we clearly see, you know, between the president elected and uh, his nominated cabinet, and I have, do have a different view. So we heard in the past, in the hearing process, right, some of his cabinet do hold a different view from him and from his Twitters. So we don't know. I think, uh, but implicitly, this is quite a big uncertainty, right? If the president and his team have a different view on the key global issues, the whole world have to watch carefully. Mr. Barol, I have to ask you about uh, the oil industry and energy industry's perspective on this, because Donald Trump has said that he will shore up U.S. drilling. There's talked about shale output increasing, alternative sources of energy increasing. But yet you have Saudi Arabia who's welcomed his presidency, he said his stance against Iran is great, and Saudi Arabia has been consistently making those production cuts. So what happens to the energy market in 2017? It is a bit too early. Uh, to make some judgments about the energy and climate policies that the new U.S. administration is going to follow. But uh, one uh, message is emerging clearly, namely a new U.S. administration will put a lot of emphasis on the U.S. oil and gas production. I would expect that in the next four years, U.S. oil and gas production and most likely exports will increase substantially as a result of a lot of uh, new pipelines building and some of the regulations are being less pronounced and make the uh, life easier for the oil and gas industry therefore to bring the uh, cost of production down and therefore uh, it may well uh, be the case that uh, in the next four years uh, US emerges as a superpower of hydrocarbons oil and gas what about oil prices? Are triple-digit uh, days over? That era is completely over, and would, would we see just a 50 to $60 band? I don't know if it is completely over, but uh, to see a $100 or triple-digit uh, in the presence of the uh, U.S. shale oil, a, a big uh, a amount of reserves are there, is very difficult. And uh, I expect it as a result of this OPEC uh, decision, uh, when the prices went up 8 $9, uh, U.S. oil production will restart uh, to increase substantially in the year 2017. 
Right. Gita, I want to get you on the India context in the macroeconomic scenario. Uh, there's been conversation here about India is not really the story right now. There's too much happening with the likes of uh, what we've already spoken about, protectionism in the U.S. and Europe as well as uh, China's retaliation. Where does India fit in, particularly the fact that we've had our sputters because of demonetization as well? Um, India is still a very promising economy. Uh, there are a few economies in the world that can claim to be anywhere close to a 7% growth rate, and India has that potential. Uh, I think the demonetization is certainly a, a, a problem. It threw some sand in the wheels. Uh, but in a couple of quarters, I should expect things to go back to normal with you know, some maybe long-run effects. Uh, so India is certainly a very much uh, a growth story. Now, I think it is a problem for India if Trump becomes very protectionist, both in terms of outsourcing work, in terms of imports, uh, and that will hit India negatively. Martin, what is your read on the, how India should perceive Trump in, in, the, in the global context? Because we know that he's spoken out against China, imports from there. He's spoken about what he'll do to Mexico, the focus on U.S. companies, 35% tariffs. But how do countries like India, who have that uncertainty, look at him? First of all, as far as I can see, and I haven't followed everything he says, India is not a target for Mr. Trump. Uh, and uh, that's rather encouraging in this terrible world. Uh, I think in principle one could imagine that somebody like Mr. Modi, with his particular view and stance, might get on quite well with Mr. Trump. There they, 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 they would be, a, to some degree, a sort of, uh, a, a, there could be some meeting of minds. He might even admire the, dr the dramatic decision to demonetize uh, as a sort of decisive action. I personally think it was completely mad, but that's uh, another matter uh, altogether. So I think the relationship could be quite good. The, if they are going to focus on trade with India, it will be exactly as was said, it will be on outsourcing, and that could be a bit of a target. India is not seen as a highly competitor of ex competitive exporter of goods, that's not the problem. It will be about services and outsourcing. But at the moment, it looks as though India will not be direct target. So the real risk is that the world economy gets really badly hit. Uh, at the moment, the IMF has been rather optimistic. They seem to think the fiscal policy expansion uh, and the deregulation will help the world economy more than hinder it. But as uh, Jumin emphasized, this is an incredibly uncertain time. And if the world economy is really hit by trade wars, real conflict, of course India will, which is now quite an open economy, will be badly hit. Zoom in, let me get your perspective on this, because uh, what, what do you feel will really be the messaging coming out in 2017 itself? Because here I've heard on ground and in Davos corridors that we could see another 2008, 2009, the same way a financial crisis rocked the world then could be the geopolitical crisis rocking the world now. Well, the message is very clear, to support the globalization and the working together to support economic growth because we still have uh, billions of people living in poverty. Growth is still so way low. Uh, we have historical low growth since 2008 in the past few years. I think support of strong growth and the support of globalization is the key message for the whole world to see. We have to work together. If you start a trade war, you start a whole visual circles, right? So everybody have to respond actively and uh, the whole world will suffer. Nobody will be the winner. So I think at this point, I think it's a critical for all the parts of the world, the business community, political leaders, medians, all of them to work together to support the globalization and to support economic growth. I'm going to quickly talk about one key theme which is immersion, Martin, if you can just uh, jump into that, is automation, artificial intelligence and what it means to jobs creation in the rest of the world. Do you feel Davos has come out with some conclusive answers? No, I, I think we are all in the middle of a big debate. This fourth industrial revolution has been a theme of uh, Davos now for a couple of years. There's no doubt lots of interesting technology is happening. Unfortunately, we're not seeing it in the productivity growth numbers, which is rather disturbing. I wish it, we were, but we aren't. I think that's genuine. I don't think it's a measurement problem. Uh, I don't believe we are in a suddenly having a much faster destruction of jobs than in the past. It's an ongoing process. We've seen this throughout the modern economic growth. Uh, so I think this is an overhyped story. 
But, of course, there are very significant and important technological changes going on. They will continue to transform our economies. And we have to develop policy systems that manage it and manage the consequences. And we've done very badly with that. So in addition to Xu Min's emphasis on globalization, with which I agree totally, the second thing is at home in our own economy, particularly in the developed world where we're rich enough to do so, we have to help people adjust to change. I'm going to quickly ask you one final question, uh, and uh, I'll start with you. Just uh, zoom in if you can talk about the end of the year. So when we are sitting back here in 2018, hopefully not an, on as freezing a day, but most likely it will be, uh, what is the world that you feel will be the outcome then? I'm not optimistic at this moment. I think uncertainty is huge. So it's very difficult to predict the end of the year what will happen, but I, I'm, I think we probably were facing more challenges this year, much more than we thought. I agree with the point that there is tremendous uncertainty. I mean, for, we know there are a few big events that are going to roll out. One is, uh, you know, UK truly starting the whole divorce proceedings and getting into negotiations, and, and that's going to be a major event. The French elections are going to be another big event. Uh, and we will see how much of uh, Trump's uh, you know, bluster turns into actual action and words. And my actual concern is that protectionism might actually become an even bigger issue in 2018 than now because a lot of what Trump is doing in terms of fiscal policy would lead to a stronger dollar, uh, which would then grow the trade deficit and the current account deficit. And so maybe a year from now we might actually be sitting here talking more seriously about protectionism. Uh, in my case, in the case of uh, energy and oil markets, I think we will see a greater uh, volatility of the oil prices throughout 2017 and the political uncertainties are definitely killers for the energy investments as they are uh, large scale investments and they uh, require a certainty and uh, I hope that these uncertainties will be reduced to a minimum but uh, it may not be the case. And I would add that they, I think we do, haven't seen the end of the populist wave and the next real big risk if we're looking at the next year is the French presidential elections if and I think it is possible though not probable Marine Le Pen becomes president then we have a massive massive EU crisis which could affect the future of the Eurozone and that could be the next stage of the really big political economic crisis and the second thing that really concerns me is if we get the super strong dollar with protectionism together it's going to be very very bad for the emerging economies particularly with lots of dollar debt and we might be worrying about some really bad crisis hit stories not the countries we've been talking about but other countries so that i'm afraid it's very difficult for me to be optimistic about the next year i would expect the world in a year from now to look worse than it does now so uncertainty, no time to sit back and foggy times ahead. Thank you so very much uh, for joining me and for your excellent insights. Thanks, that was yeah, great. Yeah. Great pleasure.